at a Gordon conference. And it was like just a really super outstanding talk. So I'm really excited to hear him speak again. Um, Seth has many titles. So he's at the Van Vanderbilt University and he is an endowed professor of biological sciences. He's the director of the Vanderbilt Microbiome Innovation Center, which just sounds really neat to me. Um, the associate director of the Vanderbilt Institute for Infection, Immunology and Inflammation, and also a professor in multiple departments. Um, he does a lot of work studying how or organisms live together and work together. Um, so particularly host microbe symbioses, which I'm sure we'll be hearing about tonight. So thank you so much for speaking with us. And um, with that, I will turn it over. Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you everybody for coming tonight and for the invitation from Dustin uh, and to allow me to take some of your evening uh, to share some science with you. Uh, I will just start by saying that uh, as an undergraduate, I was doing research in this field that I'll present on uh, back in 1995-ish. Uh, and it captured my mind then, and it still captures my mind today. So for those of you that are teaching undergraduates or are undergraduates, um, what an influence science and science education can have, because uh, many of us are still doing what we first got fascinated by uh, in those early days. Um, and it's been a dream come true. A lot of things that we didn't think were possible uh, are now possible in our field. To see that happen is really the gift of science. So let me go ahead and get my presentation up. And is that in full screen mode? Okay, great. All right. Um, so without further ado, let's just hop right into it. This is a schematic uh, image of a lot about what we'll talk about today. So this is a sliced open bacteria. Um, these are bacteriophages coming out of it. And this bacteria is actually an endosymbiont. So it lives inside the cells of various arthropod organisms. And it does so in the reproductive tissues where uh, it now appears uh, we're learning how these bacteria and bacteriophages manipulate sperm egg compatibility as well as embryonic uh, viability. So I'll have fun talking to you today about how sexual reproduction is a battleground for hosts and microbes. Okay, so this story of a very successful symbiont uh, beyond you know, our imaginations when we first learned about how common this symbiont is, begins in 1924. Uh, when Dr. Hertig and his graduate student, uh, Wolbach, were ripping open the reproductive tissues of various insect species. And in mosquitoes, they found that there was this rickettsia-like microorganism. That's because it looked physically like rickettsia, but it was inside the cells of the reproductive tissues. They looked at enough um, insect species, not a whole lot, but enough to say, hey, we keep seeing this rod-shaped bacteria inside the reproductive tissues, this is likely to be very common. And what's amazing is that uh, they were exactly right, kind of beyond our imagination, because molecular surveys uh, in the 1990s showed that this bacteria, named Wolbachia, after Dr. Wolbach, occurs in roughly 50% of all of the world's arthropod species worldwide. Uh, and so it's very likely that the fly that lands on your banana or the spider in your closet, um, these are likely to contain Wolbachia uh, bacteria. So I'll tell you a lot more about them as we go through this seminar. Uh, I'll first tell you about the hosts because the host is something we can see and, and have a perspective on. Um, this is a very common laboratory organism we use called the Nasonia parasitoid wasp. You're gonna observe a male and female uh, doing courtship and mating behaviors. It often is the male chases the female to then suspend her and court her. Uh, close up, they are called jewel wasps. That's because they have a metallic green sheen and these golden legs. They are parasitoid wasps. Um, they sting fly hosts. And if we were to rip open these wasp abdomens in their reproductive tissues, we would also see Wolbachia bacteria, something like this. It's about a micron in size. And you'll notice that the cell itself is rather boring. 
but there's a lot of membranes around this cell. That's, those are often Golgi-derived membranes, eukaryotic membranes from the host that surround this endosymbiont in the reproductive tissues. And if we use fluorescent markers, we can go right into the testes or the ovaries and fluorescently stain for Wolbachia in red uh, and then an orange here in the ovaries. These are predominantly reproductive bacteria, um, which is one of the main modes of, of symbiotic interactions is reproductive symbiosis. Um, they do occur in somatic cells, but they're much more uh, common in terms of densities and titers inside the testes and ovaries where they wield a lot of their uh, fascinating actions. So uh, one of those actions is that they are maternally inherited from mother to offspring. So while they occur in the testes, only the ovaries population is inherited into, into the developing oocytes and then into the egg itself, the embryo itself. So this is a wasp embryo with Wolbachia stained in green and the mitotically dividing host DNA in blue. As you can see, there's this cocktail of uh, green fluorescent Wolbachia endosymbionts in this posterior end of the embryo. And there's a snow cone effect where it becomes less dense throughout the embryo, some spots here as well. Now, notably, this part of the embryo where the pole cells develop become the reproductive tissue cells where the new testes and ovaries of the next generation develop. This bacteria is already centering in on its inheritance mode as early as embryonic development by localizing itself towards that posterior end of the embryo. Uh, quite a cunning bacteria. Now, inside the uh, adult tissues, we can do cross sections of various tissues. And a technician in my lab, Michelle Marshall, a while ago, did just that. And not only do you have a Wolbachia inside an embryo, but what she was able to confirm that others had also found is that there are bacteriophage particles inside the Wolbachia cells, which is what I'm showing here. This is the outline of a Wolbachia cell. And then there's this phage population with the black arrows. And it looks as if they're lysing the Wolbachia cell where maybe a physical membrane is being disrupted as these phages exit out of the Wolbachia cell. Over here is a unlysed Wolbachia cell. It's actually going through the act of lysis. There's a membrane here that has collapsed. I think that's the bacterial inner membrane that collapsed from here towards the inside. That's sort of the first step in phage lysis as these particles make their way out. There's also a densely stained degraded DNA patch. And this phage containing Wolbachia cell is right next to a normal Wolbachia cell, which lacks the phage. So very granular in structure, sort of rod shaped inside the testes of this wasp that we study. And here are some phage particles just floating around in the tissues after they lice open the Wolbachia. Now, and one major reason for why Wolbachia are so interesting, besides their distribution, um, and besides their sort of reproductive modes of inheritance, is that Wolbachia are being used worldwide in at least 12 countries to control the transmission of arboviral diseases, such as Zika virus, dengue virus, and chikungunya virus. So these blue countries are where the World Mosquito Program is releasing Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. And they do that, uh, at least in Australia, there's a local, there has been a local outbreak of dengue cases over the last 20 years. Each one of these black bars indicates the documented locally acquired dengue virus cases from mosquitoes. But they started to release Wolbachia infected mosquitoes um, in the late uh, 2015 to 2020 range. And the increasing green indicates the increasing frequency of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. What happens is the number of locally acquired dengue cases essentially goes to zero. Um, there is no more locally acquired uh, dengue virus transmission. Now, um, this is because Wolbachia confer a mysterious pathogen blocking trait in which they essentially immunize the mosquitoes from replicating the virus inside the salivary glands. And therefore when the mosquitoes bite, they don't transmit this virus anymore because it's really just not there, it's suppressed. This has now been accomplished all over the world in these countries and cities. And this indicates the percentage of reduction in dengue virus cases over the time period listed here. So it's just overwhelmingly satisfying to see that a basic science organism from 1924 onward has become now a wonderful tool for controlling some of the world's most devastating diseases.
And um, they can do that because what happened was they took the Melanogaster wolbachia, this WML Melanogaster from Drosophila wolbachia, and put it into Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that transmit the viruses. And as I noted, that blocks dengue virus Wolbachia. and Zika virus transmission. So essentially what they do in these countries across the world now is they have a local population that's uninfected with Wolbachia, which transmits the virus. And then they steadily increase the amount of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes by releases going neighborhood by neighborhood, opening canisters of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes till eventually they replace the population. And now you have a Wolbachia infected population that suppresses dengue virus transmission. And it's extraordinarily effective. Another major reason for why Wolbachia is so fascinating, this is more from a basic science perspective, is they can contribute directly in some species to the origin of new species to reproductive isolation. Um, and this occurs, in fact, in this Nisonia case that I've been telling you about. We have four close related Nisonia species they diverged about 1 million years ago or less. They're geographically distributed in North America, sometimes in Sympatry, where the lines cross over. And when these wasp species attempt to interbreed, Wolbachia causes a sperm egg problem and prevents the species from forming viable F1 hybrids. And so because Wolbachia is present, they can't form F1 hybrids and the embryos die. But in the absence of Wolbachia, these species can readily interbreed, and we've shown that in the lab um, quite effectively. So it's the presence of this symbiont that causes most of the reproductive isolation and therefore speciation activity in this system. This is not an isolated case. More and more systems have putative or very good evidence for Wolbachia contributing to reproductive isolation and host speciation. Now, Lynn Margulis long advocated for this idea and she would have just loved to be alive to see all of these cases and evidence emerging in favor of some of her uh, advocacy positions on this issue. Okay, so why, how, what's going on here? Well, um, underneath the hood of the vector control and now the speciation angle is a phenomena that relates to Wolbachia's greatest adaptive weapon, and that's called cytoplasmic incompatibility. Now take note of this Punnett square here and make sure you listen in because this will come up time and time again. And it's a good reference for a, a lot of the details of the talk. So what we're showing here is colored in circles are infected with Wolbachia or symbiotic. And then the uninfected or aposymbiotic ones are, are, are unfilled circles. The key cross is when an infected male crosses to an uninfected female. That's where you get the CI or the cytoplasmic incompatibility and the embryo dies. However, if an infected male mates to an infected female, the embryos live and they are all infected embryos. In addition, an uninfected male mated to an infected female, also they lay viable offspring that are infected. And that's because these bacteria, remember, are maternally transmitted. So mom transmits the bacteria, uninfected mothers do not. What's the point? Well, the point is, is that CI confers in this Punnett square a twofold reproductive advantage. It essentially renders the fitness of uninfected females half because of the death here as much as the infected females. And therefore, Wolbachia selfishly and deterministically can spread into populations like we do in the vector control applications. Now, why and how does this happen has been one of the biggest questions in our field. Um, and does it ultimately explain the great distribution of Wolbachia across the world? So this is a little bit about what's happening in these matings that lead to CI versus a normal cross. Now, in the first mitotic event after fertilization between a sperm and an egg, a normal cross will have paternal and maternal chromatin dividing. But in a CI cross, we see several types of problems, including this chromatin bridging. This is the paternal genome from the infected father after fertilization, not going through mitosis properly and it shreds the DNA. And that leads to what's called an aneuploid or dead embryo. So that's a problem number one. Sometimes the embryos get past this point and the CI embryos still replicate, still have mitosis going on, but there's missing regions of mitosis. Um, we call this sort of regional failure of mitosis. And here the embryos will also die early in embryonic development 
just a little bit different than how they're dying here. A sort of catastrophe of mitotic problems is how you can think about it. Okay, so with that context then, um, the central sort of holy grail question for decades has been what genes have weaponized Wolbachia to achieve its great success, to cause animal speciation events, and now to be used to human benefit for vector and pest control. Uh, and these are some of the companies beyond the world mosquito program. There's a Kentucky company called Mosquito Mate, and there's a Google spin-off company called Verily that are doing pest and vector control with Wolbachia. So we set out on a mission to solve this. It's been a long-term goal of ours for many years. And Jason here and Sarah really led the charge on the comparative omics techniques that we use to get at the genes that cause CI. Um, so we looked at many genomes of Wolbachia that cause CI, that do not cause CI, thinking, well, hey, there might be genetic differences that allow us to distinguish the genetic basis of CI versus non-CI strains. In addition, we've layered in transcriptomes from ovaries and proteomes from ovaries. And you'll notice in the middle of the Venn diagram here, that's where our candidate gene number will be, two genes. Now we thought we were dead wrong because nobody gets two genes when you do a multi-omic analysis. Usually it's hundreds. But if it was right, it provided a very streamlined set of candidates to test. These genes will call for the rest of the talk, uh, SIFs or CI factors, A and B. And they localize to a prophage region inside the Wolbachia genome. That prophage region looks like this. It's a rather long sort of 50 to 70 kilobase genome. And the two SIF genes are adjacent to each other, SIF A and SIF B. Now SIF A and SIF B occur in a module that we call the eukaryotic association module that's dedicated, we think, to host interactions. It's an enormously large prophage region uh, that really has broken some of the rules about how we think about phage genomes because we typically think about them as modular with head genes and replication genes and tail genes. And then about half of this genome though is just to get dedicated to what we think are host interaction genes. It's a massive amount of accessory genes. Okay, the CIF-A and CIF-B genes are adjacent. And notably when we do sequencing and analysis, when we make two phylogenies, the two phylogenies are mirror images of each other. So CIF-A and CIF-B are what we call co-diverging if not co-evolving and functioning together. Across the great uh, phylogeny of Wolbachia, there's a lot of different phylogenetic supergroups, divergent lineages that we've labeled with letters. And yet we've also noted their host range above those groups. The point I wanna bring to the phage biology is you'll notice wherever the phages are, they tend to be in arthropods and they tend to be associated with this orange hue color, right? Phage, orange, phage, orange, phage orange, phage orange. Well, we know in these particular groups of Wolbachia that they are parasites, they cause these kinds of reproductive shenanigans. And so there's by association a link between the prophages or the phages and these types of sexual shenanigans that the Wolbachia are well known for. Now we have two genes. How do we test them? How do we functionally test if they cause CI or not? Well, Wolbachia is a very finicky bacteria. It's an endosymbiont. We don't have the genetic tools yet to modify it. We barely have the tools to cultivate it outside of its host. So instead we turn to heterologous expression inside the Drosophila genome. Here we are taking advantage of a genetic system called the GAL4 UAS system used to transgenically express genes of interest under promoters that occur in specific tissues. Well, you might think for the SIF genes, we'll express them in the reproductive tissues and that's exactly what we do with the promoter. The promoter launches GAL4, which is a protein that simply binds to an upstream activating sequence. So it binds to an upstream activating sequence and then launches the expression of the CIF-A or CIF-B gene. So instead of using an infected male, we're now using a transgenic male, which has CIF-A or CIF-B or both genes. And we want to know, can we recapitulate what the Wolbachian normally do? This was a leap of faith in some sense. We did not know if we could express these prophage derived genes in an animal model and recapitulate what seemingly is a complex problem for generating cytoplasmic incompatibility. We had a team of graduate students and undergraduates embark on this. 
and uh, I'll show you some of that data. So in red will be the CI data and in blue will be the no CI or the rescue data. And the, the rescue is a key cross here because if we express these genes and that causes embryonic death, we should also be able to rescue that embryonic death when we cross those transgenic males to an infected female. Okay, so here's our control, just wild type cytoplasmic incompatibility with infected male to uninfected female. Notice on the axis here, embryonic hatching is a bit below 20%. So that's in the range of what we normally see as a dead, an inviable, incompatible set of crosses. There's some viability, but most of those eggs die. Okay, if we transgenically express CIFA on its own, you'll notice we don't get any CI, typical amount of variation in Drosophila laying, but nothing interesting that recapitulates the trait. We express CIFB alone and we get the same phenomenon. We were about to give up, except we had this last minute thought that we really should have had from the beginning, which was, wait a minute, these are adjacent genes that co-diverge. Why don't we express them together? So we went ahead and made the genetics to combine CIFA and CIFB together. And lo and behold, when we get transgenic expression of both genes, we can recapitulate the embryonic death. And it's even more strong than the wild type CI because transgenic expression is uh, much higher natively or much higher transgenically than the CIF genes are expressed natively. The key cross is the rescue cross. And notice we were able to achieve rescue. So the CIF AB genes, which cause CI here, are nullified. That event is nullified by the infected female. Therefore, we don't have a transgenic artifact. We have Wolbachia recognizing these transgene products from CIF A and CIF B as CI factors, bona fide CI, at least in our mind. We continued to take advantage of this transgenic system, but we express those genes then in older aged males because they express diffuse CI, weaker amounts of CI than young males. So here's what that looks like. Here's an infected male mate to an uninfected female. And now CI is a bit more variable and has a higher average or median around 30%. What happens when we express CIF A and CIF B with those? Well, you can see it goes a little bit stronger now, and that's a significant difference. CIF B recapitulates that. And then when we combine the two genes together, we get even a stronger significant reduction in CI. So what this is akin to is sort of titrating in the CIF A protein or the CIF B protein or both to ultimately make CI more strong, more penetrant. Um, and this became extra convincing to us that it was a bona fide CI system transgenically rather than an artifact. Okay, well, there's a little bit more we can do because we talked about the cytological basis, the way the DNA is, is messed up in embryos, especially mitosis. So here again is a normal wild type or rescue cross. And here there's a painting of the paternal and maternal genome in different colors as they're dividing. So father's DNA is in purple. This is a, an hour into development and now you've got normal mitosis with a red DNA stain. Now in a CI cross, once again, you get this chromatin bridging. And as you can see, the paternal chromatin is in the middle. That's what's being shredded. That's what's not properly replicating. We also see these embryonic failures, these regional mitotic failures, as well as chromatin bridging, the kind of shredding of the DNA even later in development. Um, this is transgenically recapitulated. I'm not showing you all the data here, but it also affirmed that we can recapitulate the cytology of how these embryos die. All right. So at this point, you might be wondering if this is convincing enough, what is the full genetic basis of CI? Because we've only talked about the first half. What about the rescue side? What are the genes by which the infected female or the embryo can nullify the CI and cause rescue? We were left with a very simple hypothesis, which was the same genes that cause CI may be involved in rescue as well. Because if you recall, the Venn diagram centered our attention to two genes and only two genes. So if the whole system is going to be recapitulated, it might be through these two genes. So we went ahead and tested that. And now I'll show you to make a long story short that when we cross CIF A and CIF B to a CIF A female now expressing the CIF A product only, we can achieve rescue. So here's the CIF A B transgenic CI, low hatching. Here's the good old rescue crosses. Here's an infected female crossed to a, an infected male crossed to a CIF A female 
that is rescued. And you'll also know this key cross here where the dual infected or dual transgenic male that causes CI now has the CI nullified because CIFAX is expressed in the females. We call this then the two by one genetic model of CI. And it's worth pausing here and thinking to ourselves, vector control, animal speciation, and essentially a global symbiont success story boils down in part to two genes, two of which cause CI and one of which rescues. A extremely simple genetic basis for major ecological, evolutionary, and human benefit applications. A lot of this work was done by Dylan uh, to find the rescue gene and develop this model, who was a former graduate student in my lab. So Dylan went along with uh, an undergrad in the hip to then dissect the essential sites and regions of the CIF-A and CIF-B sequences to understand how do they contribute to CI. So what we did is we made amino acid substitutions at various positions throughout the CIF-A and CIF-B genes. Um, CIF-A1 would just have these two amino acid substitutions. And those would be separate from CIF-A2, which would have these two amino acid substitutions. In CIF-A, we mutated a region in unannotated area. We mutated a region that has a nuclear localization signal, a domain of unknown function, and then an STE predicted transcription factor. In CIF-B, we did the same approach in unannotated region, the nuclease domain here, which is a PDDXK family nuclease, another nuclease domain here, and then a ULP1, which is essentially a protease domain, which has been found to be a D ubiquitinase. Okay. I'm not going to show you all the crosses, but I will show you the general results. So in terms of CIF-A's function on the rescue side, these, these front half of the genes, these five prime end of the genes are essential for rescue because if we mutate them, we can no longer rescue. Interestingly, the other half, this back half here, is also involved in CI on its own from the male side. And these two regions, again, are also essential for CI on the male side. So we have different regions of the CIF-A gene involved in both CI and rescue versus only CI. Now that makes sense because CIF-A both contributes to CI and rescue CI. And so we see these partitioning potentially of the gene or protein functions across the gamut of these phenotypes. On the CIF-B side, it's only involved in the induction of CI in embryonic lethality. And wherever we mutate it, we ultimately lose the ability to cause CI. So every portion, including unannotated regions, are essential for the induction of CI. <clears throat> All right. So this got us through to a lot of the functional genetics of a simple genetic basis and the essential regions and sites important for cytoplasmic incompatibility. But what is the mechanism? And now that we have the genes, we can interrogate that. So we took this thinking approach that inside the testes is where SIFs are launching their activity to modify sperm. So what you see here is the early developing um, spermatocytes in the hub. This is essentially the germline stem cell area where new early sperm cells are made. And as you curl this out, you start to get sperm tails and fully developed sperm heads at the end of this curl. So if you were to unfold the curl, and linearize this, you would have an image that shows the germline stem cells, the spermatogonium, the spermatocytes, the elongation of these sperm cells into something that looks like a spermatid, um, the individualization of these spermatids from a bulk of spermatids to sing single separate spermatids. Ultimately that occurs in the testes and the sperms are ready and mature inside the storage organ of the seminal vesicle. And the question is, where are the CIF proteins? Where are the CIF proteins? And what are the modifications to the sperm genome that these genes elicit to modify the paternal chromosomes? So we had a wonderful uh, postdoc team of uh, Dr. Brittany Lay and Dr. Rupinder Kaur, who's now an assistant research professor, interrogate that exact problem. And essentially it's now a cell biological project uh, coupled with the genetic system that we have developed. Now, as I mentioned, CIF-A has a NLS, a nuclear localization sequence. Well, Brittany developed antibodies for the CIF-A and CIF-B proteins, 
and we co-stain with DAPI to see where these proteins are relative to the nuclei. Um, Rapinder developed the detailed analysis of which peptides antibodies work the best and took these images. So in the apical tip, all the way through the round onion sort of middle stage spermatogenesis here, we can see that the CIF-A protein is localized to the nuclear DNA of the developing sperm cells. The same is true for CIF-B. There's no strong signal in the apical tip at the germline stem cells, but just after that, we also see CIF-B localized to the nuclear material. Interestingly, it continues. Um, so these are the canoe stage spermatids right here where they undergo elongation and the sperm heads are stretching out. As you'll notice, the CIF-A protein is uh, sort of at the cap end of the sperm head. It might even be in the acrosomal, developing acrosomal region here. CIF-B also localizes to a similar area, but is a bit more diffuse. It kind of extends across that tip rather than just hugging it. In the needle spermatids at individualization, where this group of spermatids separates into separate ones, we didn't see a signal. Now you can conclude here that perhaps the proteins are stripped away from spermatogenesis, but an alternative is that the material is so densely packed, the antibodies couldn't penetrate the material for staining. So uh, Rapinder wonderfully had a decondensation assay that allowed her to essentially decondense those sperms and get a view on those CIF proteins and where they are in those developing sperm. And what she showed is uh, the sperm tails now in this mature sperm have CIF-A in them. That's that green speckling pattern. Um, and then the sperm heads uh, in, in for CIF-B contain and still contain that CIF-B protein. So there's a little bit of a change now where the CIF-B protein remains in the head and the CIF-A protein is distributed along the sperm tails and is infrequently associated with the sperm heads as well. Okay, so let's take a deeper look and combine the genetic system with the spermatogenesis cell biology. And this round onion stage spermatid became of interest to us because we had a mutant in this uh, NLS sequence. And we expressed that mutant um, during the cytoplasmic incompatibility phenomenon. But when we express that mutant, there's no CI. And guess what? There's no nuclear localization anymore. So this is the merge signal with DAPI. Now, normally CIF-A would be nuclear located. Instead, it's now cytoplasmically located. So by deleting that nuclear localization sequence, we mislocalize the protein, and then the protein can no longer wield its action to cause CI. So nuclear localization, essentially evasion of the nucleus by these prophage proteins um, is a requisite for cytoplasmic incompatibility. Okay, so let's get to some of the molecular phenomena of spermatogenesis and what happens to the genome integrity of these sperms. Now, a very conserved phenomena from mammals to insects, uh, from mice to flies, is what's called the histone to protamine transition. Early in spermatogenesis, histones are deposited onto the sperm. And later in spermatogenesis, those histones are lost and they're replaced with protamines. Now histones are large proteins, which is why we see this kind of large circular uh, DNA staining. That's because the histones are not fully tightening up the DNA. They're, the proteins are a little bit bigger. Protamines are small and tiny. So they can more wind up that sperm DNA and that's why we get these thin sperm heads. Okay, the histone to protamine transition happening at this late canoe stage. Now we focused on that stage to stain for histones. This is a core histone antibody. And we stain those histones under a negative control that lacks Wolbachia, a positive control that has Wolbachia and causes CI, and then the transgenic positive that causes CI as well, expresses the dual CIF-AB proteins. And what you'll see here that's abnormal is that there's an extensive amount of histone retention in the CI causing sperm at the late canoe stage relative to the normal late canoe stage. And we quantified that uh, across a number of sperm bundles, spermatid bundles. And as you can see, there's strongly significant differences relative to the negative control. The one that doesn't cause CI has a normal histone loss. The ones that do cause CI retain their histones and they do so in a way that's reflective of the penetrance of CI, because if you remember, the transgenic CI causes stronger CI and it has, has stronger uh, histone retention. All right, let's flip the other side now and go to 
later in spermatogenesis. Now we're talking about protamine deposition. And here we're looking at the end point, the mature sperm, because these mature sperm should have protamines on them after the histone protamine uh, uh, transition has completed itself. Okay, so what do we see here? Well, uh, what Rapinder saw here was under normal uninfected compatible sperm, males that are, have compatibility, there is a, a, a low green stain here. And that green stain is CMA3, which is a DNA stain for protamine deficiency. So if it was a strong stain, like over here, protamines would be deficient. If it's a weak stain, then there's just a normal amount of proteins, protamines on that sperm. So it's a little bit inverted, right? The, the stronger the stain, the more deficient the sperm are in protamines. And as you can see, the CI sperm from Wolbachia positives and dual transgenics that cause CI also have a protamine deficiency. And that's quantitated over here as well. So as you can put this together, histones retained, protamines aren't deposited properly. And now we have what is the catastrophe of the sperm problem that their chromatin integrity has been fundamentally altered to result in incompatibility. Now that was association data. The real causal data that allows us to sort of go to this conclusion uh, is that we can use mutants in protamines from the Drosophila toolkit. Now this is a Wolbachia minus strain with a protamine mutant. So it lacks protamines or some of the protamines normally deposited on sperm. And as you can see, it's a very protamine deficient line as measured by the CMA3 stain. We also have this protamine mutant line with a Wolbachia infected background, similar story, just a lot of protamine deficiency. The WML minus has normal amounts of protamine, so its protamine deficiency is lower. The WML plus, which causes CI, has protamine deficiency and it's higher than the MEL minus, but a little bit lower than these full-blown protamine mutants. Now what Rapinder and our research assistant Bella showed is that these two categories of strains cause CI, the WML plus when it has Wolbachia and the protamine mutant plus, which has Wolbachia as well. The uninfected lines don't cause CI. But what was fascinating is that when the protamine mutant is combined with the Wolbachia and the protamine plus, these are the CI data. You'll see here that the hatch rate is significantly lower than when you have a normal protamine fly with Wolbachia. So it's as if the Wolbachia plus the protamine mutant causes a exacerbation of the problem and therefore leads to stronger CI. In other words, Wolbachia really does work with this protamine deficiency. And when you give it extra protamine deficiency, you get extra CI. Uh, so this is causal then to the trait. Okay, so we can sum all of this up in what we're calling the host modification model of CI. Uh, this is uh, just a little bit of a recap. There's a fly with reproductive tissues. Wolbachia occur in those reproductive tissues. Inside those reproductive tissues uh, is a fly, Wolbachia, that has a prophage region. And inside that prophage region uh, are these two CIF A and CIF B genes slash proteins. Um, when we localize those proteins, we can see them in the nuclear material early in development of spermatogenesis. In the spermatocytes, in the elongating sperm, they tend to associate in the acrosomal region. And we have a histone protamine problem with the DNA and the chromatin integrity that persists um, to mature sperm, where then the CIF-B protein localizes again to the acrosome, but the CIF-A protein has been stripped down into the sperm tail for reasons we don't quite know why yet. On the flip side of this, we have work to do, but our hypothesis for rescue through the host modification model is um, these modified sperm which have the proteins, ultimately those proteins get lost after fertilization. And in the uninfected egg, you've got a, a genome modified from the father and a genome unmodified from the mother. That causes mitotic havoc and catastrophe and ultimately cytoplasmic incompatibility. We think that the way rescue will work is that genome integrity will be normalized. That problem with the father's chromatin will also be occurring in the mother's chromatin, which will normalize essentially the histones retained, if you will, on those two chromosomal sets. And then they'll start mitotically dividing together. This is really what we think about as a mistiming model or a timing model. 
So long as the chromatin unwinds itself from these modifications on the same time span, then you get compatibility. But if you have these chromatin modifications causing an asynchrony in timing of processing of the DNA, that's when you get embryonic death and cytoplasmic incompatibility. Okay, so uh, some of this latter data is unpublished as of the moment, but we are very pleased to kind of get the window into the molecular genetics and mechanism now of this worldwide phenomena in use um, by vector control programs across the world. There's a second way that Wolbachia have evolved to spread themselves, and they also do it through killing of embryos. But in this case, it's the male embryos that are unfortunately targeted. Um, and I'll tell you why this makes sense for Wolbachia. So if an uninfected female lay, mates and lays eggs, those will be viable. If an infected female now with a different male killing strain of Wolbachia lays eggs, those females will be inherited the infection, daughters will develop fine, but the males are killed. The males are killed preferentially. And the reason for why some Wolbachia do this is what we call resource reallocation. And this has been shown in a few systems, um, but done exceptionally well by John Janicki. Um, we're essentially in a resource limited patch. There's limited food. If Wolbachia kills the males, the female siblings of those dead males can consume more of the limited resources. So these females will fatten, fitten up, lay more eggs in the next generation than the uninfected mothers or, or females who are competing with their uninfected brother siblings. So if that makes sense, then Wolbachia gains an advantage because it gives these infected mothers more opportunity to lay, to accumulate more resources and lay more eggs relative to the uninfected. And experimentally, that's been shown in population cage studies. The ramifications of this are quite dramatic. Um, so if you imagine males are dying at a high rate, then all sorts of crazy things can happen. And that's what's happened in these butterflies where they normally have lek mating, uh, where a group of females will come together and ultimately choose males to mate with because females are common, males are common and females get to be choosy. But in the situation where there's male killing in these butterflies, the males are rare and there's a reversal in the lek mating. The males then become the choosy sex. They group up they choose which females to mate with because there's a lot more females than males. So symbiosis uh, has some fascinating ways of affecting animal fundamentals in these uh, speciation aspects and mating behavior. Okay, so graduate students Daniel and Jesse at the time had tested some of the candidates that we were searching for for CI. And serendipitously, the non-CI candidates led to this discovery of what we're calling the WO-mediated killing genes. Now these genes differentiated CI versus non-CI strains. And, and this, then the WMK gene is really just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the CIF genes, just three genes away. Um, inside the melanogaster genome, this is what it looks like. Now we only know the melanogaster genome to cause CI. This is a caveat I want you to appreciate uh, because ultimately we test the genes from melanogaster and we transgenically express them, but they're not known to cause male killing. However, uh, a genome that's 99.9% .9 nucleotide similar to the mel melanogaster is the Drosophila recens Wolbachia. And it essentially has very similar gene synteny, exquisite homology to the melanogaster genome, and this strain causes both CI and male killing. So when we express this gene from melanogaster, we think it has the capacity to express male killing just like it does in the Drosophila recens genome. But take that with a grain of salt because it is a, a non, not known to cause male killing right now. If we do some annotations, this protein has two DNA binding helix turn helix domains with moderate amounts of significance. Okay, so it may be a transcription factor, let's say that binds to DNA and regulates transcription. The way Jesse went about transgenically testing this is to ultimately take the infected female and swap her out with the ability to express actually the gene, the WMK gene, not in the females, but in the embryos directly, because that's normally how male killing occurs is 
the expression of the male killing trait happens in the embryos themselves. And if she expresses them in the embryos, the expectation is WMK allows females to live and males to die somehow, right? We'd like to know why. Um, that's exactly what she was able to show to a degree. This isn't a fully penetrant trait. So a control transgene will normally be expressed and cause a one-to-one -one sex ratio of males to females. So this would be a non-male killing transgene. But a male killing gene, well, that's going to shift the sex ratio towards uh, females. And as you can see, now there's about half as many males as there are to females. So we get about 40% death. That's a penetrant, but not fully penetrant trait for male killing by this single gene. Um, notably, the 40% of the embryos that die during early unembryonic development are male embryos. We can determine that with a Y chromosome marker that differentiates a male embryo from a female embryo. And notably, there are lots of chromatin defects, much like we see in the CI embryos, mitotic catastrophes occurring associated with male death in those 40% of the embryos. Uh, Jesse then took this a little further in terms of mechanism. So what she found is she used two antibody markers. One is a histone variant for DNA damage, and one is a histone acetylation marker um, that's associated with a process called dosage compensation. And dosage compensation is used in Drosophila and other animals to upregulate the X chromosome activity in an XY male. So that compensates for the 2X chromosome expression in female embryos, the males just upregulate their X chromosome in a specific fashion. So that's a marker for dosage compensation or male specific activity. And as you can see, DNA damage in green associates with dosage compensation complex activity in red. This is not the case with a control transgene that doesn't cause male killing. There's no hyper amounts of DNA damage, but there is a normal amount of dosage compensation activity in the male embryos. As you can see in the female embryos, there's also less DNA damage and there's also less dosage compensation complex activity. So that really works out nicely. And here's just the quantitative data that when we express the WMK transgene, we get a lot of overlap between DNA damage and the dosage compensation markers. Okay, that's shown here. Whereas in control gene males or females, we don't see that overlap. So this suggests to us that the dosage compensation pathway is important for male killing by the WMK transgene. This is relevant because there are other cases where male killing by Wolbachia or other symbionts work through the dosage compensation complex pathway. And now we can somewhat mimic that with the transgene for WMK. Okay, um, there's an interesting sort of landscape of genotype to phenotype here with the WMK uh, gene. What we see just in schematics is the WMK gene can kill males. The WMK gene from close related strains, when we put it into Drosophila and Melanogaster, doesn't just kill males, it kills males and females. We think that reflects sort of a mistargeting, that it's trying to kill the males, but it's killing them and the females because there's some mismatch between the WMK gene function and the host background, because the WMK doesn't come from Melanogaster here, it comes from other closely related Wolbachia. And if we take WMK from very distantly related Wolbachia, forget about it, it just doesn't kill at all. And so there's this landscape of function to genetic distance of these WMK genes that seems to suggest there's a certain amount of co-adaptation for the WMK sequence with its host in order to kill males. Moreover, um, we found a crazy circumstance where silent site substitutions can change the phenotype from male killing to no male killing. Um, so this is a section of the WMK gene. It shows the codons and it shows a particular codon that we ended up mutating transgenically. Um, strain one here has a couple of bases uh, swapped out relative to the control normal male killing. Strain two only has one position mutated. It's that C that's mutated from the G. And both strain one and strain two um, have this no male killing phenotype. You'll see that the sex ratios are normal here relative to the normal WMK male killing sex ratio shift. So this single silent site substitution, this mutation, ablates the function of male killing. While this is known in some cases, it's one of the first cases in symbiosis to find that a silent site thought to be non-functional 
has a dramatic function of life and death for these male embryos. Uh, moreover, this does not relate to gene expression because you can might hypothesize, well, we change the RNA, so maybe that changes the expression profile. No, these variants are all equally expressed. What we think the problem is, is RNA structure, that we probably have changed RNA structure and therefore affected translation efficacy of these transcripts into proteins. Okay, so how does WMK now kill embryos in male embryos specifically? Well, inside a Drosophila embryo, we have host DNA and we have Wolbachia. Wolbachia makes the WMK protein. That protein can bind to DNA because we think it's a transcription factor. We think that it misregulates the dosage compensation male specific pathway, and that elicits um, the death. Some of the components here are correct. We have a lot more work to do on proving that it's a DNA binding protein and that it really does functionally work through dosage compensation complex activity. Okay, so let me wrap up and just say that um, a global symbiosis boils down to a few genes that are in this prophage module called the eukaryotic association module. So from global pandemic, really, from the arthropod world, to three genes, we get a lot of explanation of how Wolbachia spread around the world. There are now companies releasing these uh, Wolbachia in mosquitoes with these CIF genes to control viruses that harm humans. There's even a Google company that drives these vans around and the vans automatically release with rolled down windows Wolbachia infected mosquitoes into California sites or into other countries across the world, and they automate the releases of these mosquitoes from vans that are driving around. Um, the downstream uh, basic outcomes are that these phenomena affect fundamental issues for speciation, as well as mating behavior of their animal hosts. Um, quite an intriguing world to interconnect. So how important are phages in these kinds of endosymbionts? Well, um, Normally, we don't think about endosymbionts having phages, right? These are bacteria that live inside eukaryotic cells, right? And we think endosymbionts have small genomes. These eventually evolve into organelles. If they stay in endosymbiosis long enough, they'll lose all sorts of mobile genetic elements. But Wolbachia tells us differently, that this is an ancient symbiosis that has actually thrived with bacteriophage genes in many of the same ways that free-living bacteria thrive from bacteriophages. These phages are there because Wolbachia are common, probably, and have become susceptible. So the phages somehow evolved to attack this particular widespread Wolbachia symbiont, and it kills them um, because they're common. Uh, when it does kill them, the endosymbionts are lysed open by the phages. Well, that impacts the densities of these phages and then their ability to cause these sexual shenanigans as well. That's been shown in the lab by us as well. The prophages of these Wolbachia prophages are hotspots of genome evolution for Wolbachia, just like a free living bacteria. Phages often bring in uh, new DNA and mutate rapidly. The key adaptation genes or virulence genes are found in the prophage, just like virulence genes in E. coli and shigatoxins and salmonella toxins, etc. There are large scale horizontal phage transfers of the Wolbachia phage, up to 50 kilobases or larger just like in free living bacteria. And there are frequent phage gene transfers between Wolbachia in the same host cell. I'll depict that here. So what we think of as a sort of a small niche for gene transfer, uh, it turns out that if you think about the endosymbiont world, the host cell is an ecological arena for symbionts to interact, for symbionts or different Wolbachia to exchange mobile genetic elements. In this case, the phages, we have very good evidence for this to interact with material that comes in from the outside. So facultative intracellular bacteria may invade arthropod cells. And then there's an ecological arena to exchange DNA. We have evidence of phage homology between Wolbachia and facultative bacteria. And finally, we have evidence of lateral transfer to the animal nucleus. So and when you look outside and think of the forest, you might think about now arthropod cells as its own little mini wooded area where lots of things occur interact and even exchange uh, DNA. Um, Sarah has done beautiful work on the genomics of these phages. And as I mentioned, the eukaryotic association module in purple here represents a large fraction of these genomes from the phages, different variants down here. 
a lot of that is horizontally transferred. So there's a big hotspot of information flow in these purple uh, modules. Uh, finally, Sarah has also um, launched the Wolbachia project or discover the microbes within the Wolbachia project. And I know Dustin uh, and your, some of your community have used this. It's a high school and college uh, biotech series in which we allow students to take ownership of their work, pick the arthropods, identify the arthropods, extract DNA, run PCR with provided primers for Wolbachia, determine the gels that show whether they get Wolbachia in their collected arthropods. And then the sequences are done on their amplicons and which would then do a phylogenetic analysis. And so the soup to nuts work of really doing contemporary biotechnology and symbiosis biology all within the high school or college lab. And so if you'd like to get involved, check out our website here. Uh, we now have a new project database for publishing uh, student work. And so with that, I'll thank you for listening. I'll note our funding sources, some extra collaborators up top here. Um, I'll also note that my lab is recruiting a postdocs, a lab manager on the various kinds of projects that you heard about today, as well as animal associated microbiomes. Uh, this is my email. Thank you for I'll close out of my presentation and uh, see if there's any questions I can answer. All right, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Bordenstein, uh, I guess just kind of raise your hand and we'll look for you and unmute you. And I'd be happy to put up my slides too if you want to go back to anything. Yes, Heidi. Yeah, that was a wonderful talk. Let me see, I guess I should come off the into video so you can see me, yeah. Um, fantastic work, amazing. And I was curious about the, um, the phage that are uh, infecting the well back, yeah. So, um, are those, so those phage you showed with your EMs that they were actually growing inside the, um, inside as an endosymbiont in the That's same right. environment. But um, so I, I was just, you know, we normally think about phage being out in the environment and then infecting the bacteria that are free living. And so, so I don't, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. Are these phage very specific and do they only live in that endosymbiotic in, environment, you know, great in the question. host cell? Yeah, great question. We are wondering ourselves, where the heck did this phage come from? Uh, because it must have had a source before it got to Wolbachia. Um, so we see that the phage is common in the arthropod Wolbachia. Uh, there are nematode Wolbachia that have smaller streamlined genomes. They lack it. Uh, so we know that there's some specificity within the Wolbachia host range. If you look for homologs, you can find some of the closest homologs in Holospora which are other kinds of endosymbiotic bacteria, some of which occur in paramecium. Uh, and there are also metagenomes from marine environments in which we can find uh, remnants of phage genes that are, have homology to Wolbachia. Uh, so we are scratching our heads right now about how the ecology of some of these early homology hits can relate back to why Wolbachia has it. Uh, we don't necessarily know the direction of the transfer either. Um, it may just be that the databases haven't told us the full story of this phage's uh, evolutionary history. Um, but clearly, I think that we're just beginning to understand um, that endosymbionts do have phages um, and that they're probably undersampled to some degree because we don't typically think about them as containing phages. And in metagenomic projects, they may not even be annotated as associated with endosymbionts because of the milieu of the DNA. So we may have some fun kind of sleuthing through metagenomes someday to find um, what are some of the other endosymbionts that may contain this phage. Now, probably the most sure thing I can tell you is when there's co-infecting endosymbionts, even unrelated ones, between Wolbachia and let's say another kind of alpha proteobacteria that co-occur in an arthropod, there can be exchange of phage from one way or the other. We don't know the direction. So it does look like there's this community of interactions whenever there's co-infecting symbionts. Um, and this provides the vehicle of ecological. 
Yeah, I, I guess I guess the last um, second part of that is, you know, you were you saw lytic phages there, right? That's what you were showing us. But you also yep. showed us in the genome that you had prophage. So I suppose, you know, those could be, um, you know, the prophage doesn't could be have, you know, have come into that genome a long time ago. Um, but do you know the relationship of the lytic phages to the prophage? Yes, we do. Um, we know that they're the same. Uh, we know that the phage is linearized, and we know that it undergoes an inversion between the genic state. Um, so we have a really good sense of what's happening uh, with the phage particles relates to the life cycle of this temperate phage. Um, and also those phage particles can get outside of Wolbachia and be in the eukaryotic environment, which certainly raises a whole conundrum of uh, bacteriophage particles, you know, in the cytoplasm or tissues of animal cells uh, at high densities in, in the reproductive tissues for these. So there's a whole new world of uh, phage animal interactions just from a particle perspective as well. Thanks for the questions. That's great. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Yeah. Appreciate that. And uh, so Jaden, yeah, Jaden has a question here. So I want to go ahead and unmute him. Great. Um, I hope you can hear me, but, uh, all right. So I, I asked this earlier on before, before you went fully into detail, but doesn't Wallachia induce pathogenesis in insects in order to, to propagate? Yes. Yes, couldn't, it does. Couldn't this be a problem later on? Since I know there's a few organisms that, uh, can be infected by Wallachia that are, that hold diseases like nematodes that can infect dogs with heartworms or certain certain like organisms that can cause elephantitis in humans and stuff. Couldn't like isn't they or isn't there a role they play in that, even if it's just a minor role? Right. You really nailed one of the more interesting uh, human relevant applications that's on the nematode side of the story, as you nailed that um, current filarial nematodes. And one of the great discoveries in the field has been that it's the Wolbachia that caused the major inflammation response in humans, as well as canines when it comes to dog heartworm or in humans, filarial diseases such as elephantiasis or lymphatic filariasis. So uh, the way they showed that is you can just take extracts of Wolbachia and show that it induces the inflammation, whereas nematodes that lack Wolbachia have very little or lower inflammation um, that associate with these diseases. And as a result, then Wolbachia are the pathogenic agent um, that when you take your dog in for dog heartworm, uh, you can actually get rid of dog heartworm now with antibiotics and your vet should be prescribing antibiotics when they get treated for dog heartworm uh, or, or, or any other kind of canine heartworm. So that's exactly right. Um, now in the arthropod world, there's no evidence of Wolbachia transmission from arthropods to humans that would then sort of elicit these diseases, they all come from the fact that they're inside nematodes, the nematodes are secreting the Wolbachia outside of their dermis, and that launches the inflammation response. Uh, whereas a arthropod just doesn't have that kind of life history to, to do that kind of problem for, for us. Um, so good question. And yet, yeah, there's uh, the rest of this, I'll just wrap it up is, we think that the phage could be used as an anti-Wolbachia tool to one day control some of these diseases because the phage is a natural predator of Wolbachia. So we'd like to develop a phage therapy or phage therapy derivative for dog heartworm or lymphatic filarial human diseases using the phage or the machinery of the phage to take care of Wolbachia in a very specific way. All right, uh, thank you for answering and my question. I think question. maybe you're ahead here for getting me there, yeah. We have a question from uh, Rubini. She would like to Hi. go ahead and unmute. Yes, can you hear me, I believe? Yes. yes. Uh, so my question is, I'm interested about the project you're talking about using this Wolbachia-based phage to control dengue. Yeah. And is this expression limited to dengue mosquito or can we apply it for malaria and other mosquito-based uh, diseases as well? Great question. So. It has not only been used for dengue virus, but it has been used for Zika virus and chikungunya virus, as well as plant pathogenic viruses, uh, including the rice crop uh, plant hopper. 
the common theme among all of these is that they are RNA viruses. And it appears that Wolbachia, not in all many cases, can cause blocking of these RNA viruses. Um, the, there is an interest in developing this for malaria. It's not quite developed yet because it's not known, or I shouldn't say that. It may be known that the Wolbachia block plasmodium, but I'm not sure if it's known if it blocks the plasmodium that causes malaria. Uh, I haven't seen that data yet, but I do think it causes blocking of plasmodium derivatives. Uh, where I think the field may be moving is now that we know the CIF genes that cause CI, um, it will be possible to transgenically modify arthropods with the CIF genes. And so we may take something like Anopheles gambii and transgenically engineer it with the CIF genes to cause CI to then transform those populations in helpful ways to us. So that could be done by, let's say, spreading the genes transgenically with an antipathogen gene that blocks malaria, some other product that gets linked into this genetic system. Or we could use the CIF genes to crash Anopheles populations, because if we just released males that transgenically express CI, it's essentially like the sterile insect technique, and we can crash those populations. I think the field is probably more likely to move there first, um, but also in the background develop the knowledge about how uh, Wolbachia assists or, or prevents a plasmodium that causes malaria. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a big agricultural uh, uh, area for this as well. So, you know, uh, uh, just preventing arthropods that are pests to trees or pests to crops, um, you're going to see this application take off in some of those ways as well. Thanks for your question. Um, I think Jolene has some questions. So I got, um, let me read these. So are the phage genes in the eukaryotic association module expressed during lysogeny or does the host have to die in a lytic cycle to get those genes expressed? Oh, this is the million dollar question for us. Wonderful. I don't know the answer, but I love that you've asked it because we're really curious about it too. Uh, I will say that there are strains of Wolbachia that have a reduced prophage, a relic prophage, with some of the genes remaining are just the CIF genes or the WMK gene. Those can cause CI and or male killing. Uh, so we do surmise then that at least in the prophage state, they can still, lysogenic state, they can still wield their influence. But that doesn't preclude that the lytic state may be assisting um, when the particles are intact for let's say getting the proteins outside of the Wolbachia cell into the animal environment. Now Wolbachia has a type four secretion system, which seems like an obvious way for these proteins to get out. But in the alternative world would be that the phages lice and allow these proteins to get out. Um, so I currently think of both as viable, but certainly the one with the lysogenic expression and the relic prophage states uh, better substantiates the evidence at this point for that model. So Jolene actually had a follow-up question along these lines. So how does how do the CIF and WMK proteins get through the host membranes surrounding the endosymbiont? Is there also a eukaryotic membrane targeting protein in the lysis gene suite of the phage? Exactly. Uh, wow. Um, I hope you can come work in our lab someday. Well, jo uh, Jolene is, yeah. <laughs> Jolene's somewhere in here. I don't see her right now. All but right. These are excellent questions. Yes, really. Um, I'm serious about that. So we... Uh, we think that the mechanism will be related to the type four secretion system or the phages. Um, where we get fascinated by this is there is this eukaryotic membrane around the Wolbachia cell. And so the phages, if they're going to lyse the Wolbachia and maybe release these proteins, the phages have to lyse the eukaryotic membrane around the Wolbachia cell as much as they have to lyse the Wolbachia membranes. And so this endosymbiont phage is going to teach us a lot about virology and ways that we don't normally think about phages. We don't know the answer to that, but we have a really good candidate gene predictor for how the phage does that in a novel way that hasn't been seen before in phages. We don't have the functional evidence yet, but we do have a project waiting for somebody to work on that. Um, in terms of the type 4 secretion system, I'm not sure that I know the answer to this, but it would be interesting to know whether type 4 secretion systems can penetrate both through the bacterial membrane as well as the surrounding eukaryotic membrane and whether that's been investigated in other systems or not. Um, I'd be curious to know. Thanks, Jolene. Yes. 
Thanks everybody. It's been a delight to hang out with you and I really love your questions. Um, if you ever want to have follow-up discussions on this topic, or again, we are recruiting at a lot of levels, please, please, please get in touch. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bordenstein. Do you have any additional items, Kelly? Uh, no, no, nothing else. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Seth, for speaking with us. My pleasure. Enjoy your conference, everybody. Take care.